The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. Hey folks, we are just past the second anniversary of the T Tuesday Update YouTube channel covering the development of all of this T2 tile grid trying to build a best effort computing stack based on indefinitely scalable principles so that we can just keep uh, building out the tiles uh, grid farther and farther as long as we can come up with more tiles. Uh, in the end, I didn't do anything particularly special uh, for the anniversary, but I have some thoughts about uh, some slight changes going forward that I will circle back around to at the end of this update. So this one is just going to be a, a, a technical stuff, a regular one. going to talk about source routed streams, for instance plus news and so forth and then uh, we'll look forward okay so top stories this week um, the alignment problem the new book by Brian Christian who is a, a friend and a friend of the project uh, uh, is is just out it, the alignment problem is the the concern the idea the worry that as we build artificial intelligence how do we know that what they're interested in what they believe is important and worth co pursuing will be aligned with what we are interested in doing and what we are pursuing for a and um, uh, you know, uh, Brian Christian's also the author of The Most Human Human. Uh, it's a wonderful book. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I like I like his books because he, he includes stuff, of, of some of our stuff <laughs> in the book. So, you know, we're in there in the acknowledgments. Uh, um, you know, there it is. Uh, Peter, Pieter, Abiel, Rebecca Ackerman, or, you know, alphabetical order. Thanks, Dad. Uh, uh, this this uh, comment, this, this quote from Warren McCulloch that, you know, a nervous system has effectors that make marks put ink on paper and and then it might see those marks and then by conditioning those marks make become symbols and signs for other stuff and then that can be shared amongst people and just and then carried down through time it's a wonderful quote and it's stuff that I've been thinking about an awful lot it goes right to the heart of living computation um, and it, it, it's a it's a good quote for spreading this idea this indeed is the story of language literature philosophy logic mathematics and physics everything. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about at the end of this uh, uh, episode. Uh, all right. Uh, and uh, as a matter of chance, the most recent episode of our podcast, Computing Up, uh, which, you know, if you're not familiar about it, uh, you might be interested in giving it, a, uh, checking it out. The uh, emphasis is on uh, we see computing everywhere. What are the consequences of that? Just absolutely casual conversation, focusing on the big ideas. And they were this, uh, in, in this particular episode, the most recent one. Indeed, the alignment problem was a topic of our discussion. Uh, um, and uh, right, and, and Brian Christian, in fact, is one of the board members of the Living Computation Foundation, our organization that we're uh, building to pull all of this stuff together. I wanted to recall out the, uh, the Living Computation Foundation nerd numbers, the LCFNs. We have uh, now got uh, uh, 20 plus or something uh, nerds that have joined us, the nerd, the proud. Uh, um, if uh, new folks uh, don't know about this, for a $5 donation on PayPal, if you can do it, uh, you can get uh, the next available uh, LCFN, the next available nerd number. And I'm bringing this up now because I'm thinking about trying to make a little perk. You know, I really don't know how to do all this Patreon stuff. You know, I, I, I don't know. But uh, I have a thought about it, so I'll come back to that as well. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. And... You know, uh, GitHub is the place that absolutely dominates uh, uh, source code development these days, at least open source, uh, which is all of the stuff that, that I do, all the stuff that this project does is all open source for the benefit of society. Uh, uh, and they have this bar that they put at the bottom, you know, showing uh, how many contributions you have uh, each day of the week and so forth. And, you know, I hadn't really paid a whole lot of attention to it, but it seemed like, you know, my contributions were kind of light, you know, like I hadn't done anything at all all in September, you know, uh, uh, that didn't seem quite right. Uh, uh, so I looked into it and it turned out, oh, actually, because of the Living Computation Foundation, I had changed my email that was associated with the commits, the, the reports that I'm making about making my code changes, and so they weren't getting counted. So I had to do some additional configuration and then lo and behold, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, uh, I I don't want to care about this sort of thing, but, you know, once it's out there, it's hard not to. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, that looks more like the amount of stuff <laughs> that I uh, uh, have been doing, uh, for better and for worse, trying to build a whole new stack based on best effort. Uh, um, in addition, Andrew Walpole, one of the biggest supporters uh, of the project that is contributing in all kinds of ways, uh, uh, had created a game based on the movable fees based on mfm.rocks which is you know separate but it, it shares many of the fundamental principles underlying uh the movable feast machine simulator and underlying the the tiles uh the the way the computer architecture of the tiles uh, and he made a welcome to the dungeon grid game on top of the mfm.rock simulator and it, it's just it, it tickled me um and, you know, it not only uses the mechanics, the inherent physics of the movable feast style of computation for the game, it uses it for, like, the, the clearing the screen in between. And so basically the way it works is you have a, a, a map and you have a bunch of little creatures that you're controlling them all at once, and if you, you can spin them left and spin them right, and your goal is to try to drive as many of them as you can to the goal while avoiding the traps and, and not taking up too much time and so forth. So, you know, the, uh, these are a few frames from uh, his little uh, gif that he made to demo the thing. Uh, you know, what, uh, and here, you know, at the end of a level, it, it's getting wiped out by more elements in the movable feast. It's very cool. Uh, um, now, you know, when I do it, I get a massive score of 15 because I'm completely clueless. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it, this this cheats on the mechanics of the movable feast in the sense that when you type the le key left arrow and right arrow, it's somehow magically broadcast to everybody in the grid all at once, which isn't a scalable concept. Although, you know, you can simulate it for any little finite thing, and the game is really only so big. But it could it could have been made a little bit more realistic than that. But actually, that could be handled uh, uh, as a separate step. This really is, I think, kind of the first best best example of a movable feast machine game. We, we've had other ones, but this takes it up a notch. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, uh, okay, that's the news. Uh, um, <clears throat> So the biggest picture for the technology stuff has been for months and months. It's intertile events is buggy and I've been fixing the bugs, but the more I fix, the rarer they become and the more complex uh, the ones that occur become and the harder to debug. And you know, this is really bringing it home to roost. I'm saying we need to be able to have computing without hardware determinism. We need to be able to have computing without perfect repeatability, without perfect reproducibility. So how how do you plan on debugging something when you can't necessarily reproduce it, period? Uh, um, and the answer seems to be uh, locks. <laughs> If you can't set it up again, then you want to gather as much information uh, ahead of time, and you want to make that fast and lightweight. Uh, so in particular, I used to write it all to the disk all the time, and I was pounding the disk to death, whereas now uh, we have you know logging that's just happening in memory, rolling logs that are going in memory, and then when a trigger event happens, and we're going to use the flash traffic system so that when one uh, tile detects an inconsistency, which means it wants to crash it's something that needs to be debugged before it dies it's going to push out a flash traffic message to its immediate neighbors out one out two we'll see uh, uh, saying please take all of your log files commit them to disk now uh, uh, so that uh, Dave or you know the human insight developer will be able to analyze them later so we have distributed logging we have flash traffic for triggering the events but then we need some way to get the files all into one place so we can use the weaver that lines up the files based on internal uh, um, ta uh, tags within them so that you can see the relative sequence of events and find out what went wrong. Uh, uh, that's what we didn't have. That's what I've been working on for the last two weeks. Uh, um, 
So how do you move the logs? Uh, uh, these are about, you know, a megabyte in size each, uh, but they're not common data. We don't want to inject them into the common data manager. We don't want them to go everywhere. We will only want them to go specifically when the human comes in and says, I would like a file from this tile to move here, a tile from that file, a file from that tile, that tile, and that tile, all to move here, and then I will run the uh, weaver there, you know, something like that. And the way I've been building it is by building this uh, source routed stream. And I want to talk about that uh, a little bit and then wrap it up. So uh, in the internet, you have these IP addresses, you have DNS names, you know, google.com that turns into 126.224, some number. Uh, and how do you actually communicate with that number? Well, you just throw packets out with that address on it and the internet itself via routers that have tables to say, well, if you're looking for number, blah, 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 go that way and you go to the next stop and it says, oh, you want to go, blah, 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 you go that way and you get closer and closer and eventually you arrive at Google, whatever it is. Uh, uh, another way to approach it, uh, and that has a lot of complexity, right? So you have to have routers, the routers have to have tables, the routers have to update their tables, they have to deal with all kinds of stuff. A simpler approach, you know, it's really just kind of pushes the complexity elsewhere, is what's called source routing. A and so you can take a packet saying, okay, I want to send this someplace, and instead of putting an address, like an IP address, a uh, number on it, you put an actual route saying, I want to go uh, at this port on your switch first and then on the next guy I want to go out that port and then on the next switch I want to go out that port and so on and how does the source know that route that they want to take who knows? That's just pushed out of the system. And that allows the network fabric to be much simpler. And in fact, basically, it just has to look at the first piece of the address, which is the next stop that it's supposed to do, and then pop it off. Just take off the first bit of the address and send it on to the next guy. And then he looks at what is now the first bit of address and moves it on that way. So that's what I'm using to do point-to-point uh, -point stream data so that we can take a log file on the file on a tile to our northwest and pull it to us. Uh, in that case, we know what the routing is. It, it's right next to us. We want it to go out the, the southeast port on the guide northwest of us. That's what this is about. And uh, uh, all right, so this is a little bit that I started talking about last week with this with the last time with the flash traffic and so forth I, now I've actually got a few pictures of it this is what's called dir8 in the t2 tile land it's the eight position uh, directional axis and it includes so zero is north one is northeast two is east on around uh, for eight possible uh, directions from zero to seven although zero and four north and south don't actually exist as connectors uh, actual connections on a uh, t2 tile because uh, it, it doesn't have north and south connections it's only got the six for the brick wall so yeah um, I've extended that to have the number eight, meaning right here. Uh, and so that allows us to create a source root by number. So if we say, you know, I want to go in the one direction, that means go out the northeast. And so we can take all of the tiles, whatever we have available, we can imagine they're all uh, labeled with the dir eights uh, on them. And uh, we can specify a route, 1768. Uh, and the idea is eight means you're done. Uh, uh, eight is here. So this particular one, one, seven, six, eight, you just go from the front. So first we want to go in direction one. So we go in direction one. As we go in direction one, we pop off that uh, step because we've done it. Now in the way I'm doing it, what I do is when I take a connection off, uh, so that guy, he received this packet. I mean, so this is just the address, 1768. There's there's presumably a whole bunch more packet that comes after this that I'm not including here. Uh, um, so he takes off the one, uh, this tile takes off the one, and it sticks at five after the eight. Why? Because it received it on from direction five. So if you want to go back, 
the corresponding step would be a 5. And then it continues. Then it goes in the 7 direction. Uh, um, and this guy now takes off the 7 and puts a 3 right after the 8, because that's the corresponding return step. And then sends it out the 6 direction. And finally, we arrive here at 8, 2, 3, 5. It begins with 8, so that means this the, it has reached its point of delivery. This is its goal, its destination. And if you want to send a packet back to the place that this one came from, you just take the 8 off the front and stick it on the back. And indeed, it works fine. You, you head out the 2, then the 5, uh, whoops, you hit out the 2 that takes you here, uh, then the 3, yes, and then the 5, and you're back where you started. So that's it. That's source routing. Uh, uh, now, you know, in this case, uh, when we had this thing down here, instead of going 1768, we could have gone 7... Seven, eight, and we would have arrived at the same place. But who knows? Maybe this tile is busy. Maybe this tile doesn't exist. Maybe they're having a fight. Doesn't matter. The whole point of source routing is you don't know, you don't care. You leave it up to the uh, outside world, the periphery, the edge of the network to decide how to get there. Uh, um, but you would kind of like it to be the case that, you know, if this tile and this tile wanted to get involved, if this tile wanted to be a client saying, I'd like to send you a file, and, and this tile was ready to be a server saying, I'm ready to accept that file, say, uh, um, it would be nice if they didn't really exactly care what route it was that was able to get them talking to each other. So that's that's where we want. I ended up using the relative coordinates that was from the flash traffic last time. And, and this was the picture that I wanted to have last time, but it got messed up. Uh, uh, so the idea is heading out each direction get, changes your relative coordinates. You start at zero, zero. If you go out the northeast, it's plus one, plus one, and so forth. When you go out the east and west directions, you make offsets by two. So I say I'm zero, zero because I'm the center of everything. And then we can look. Uh, um, so the guy to my uh, northeast is at plus one, plus one. The guy at his at his southeast would be another plus one and a minus one going out here, which is indeed plus two, zero. So it all works out. So uh, when we make the diagonal moves, we go up one and x and uh, up, or, up or down one and x, up or down one and y. When we make horizontal moves, we go up or down by two. Uh, and using this, uh, we can take one of those roots and we can collapse it down to a relative coordinate. And that allows uh, the, uh, diff the endpoints to say, I am talking to minus two zero relative to me and the other end says I am talking to two zero relative to me and they're actually talking about each other so uh, I spent a lot of time making a lot of code yeah, you know here's some of the logging that's coming out uh, they're uh, sending bytes they're saying okay you know I've now seen uh, up through sequence number 14,345 you can send me stuff that comes after that and so on uh, um, and the way you talk to this thing is using this program called NC, which stands for Netcat, which is sort of a crazy uh, thing that's hard to be explained as far as why it ought to be called Netcat, but it's one of these Swiss Army Knife programs of communications, a very low-level program. You can use it to talk to an HTTP server. You can use it to talk to a web server. You can use it to talk to email. You can use it to talk to just about anything if you know the details of the protocol that you're going to get there. And so in this one, we can talk to our new stuff uh, on slash CDM, sockets, expert.talk, whatever it is. The first line that you send it is the root that you want to do. 813, it begins with an 8, that means you're being a server. Uh, uh, down here, we have another connection. Uh, uh, send 758 uh, through to NC. 758 means you want to be a client. You want to send stuff in the 7 direction and then in the 5 direction and then you're there. Uh, um, and so send the first line which is the place you want to go, and then start sending the data. And, and this is now beginning to work. Uh, we can actually ship files uh, from given um, just at the Linux command line going through the uh, bulk 
packet, the same the same carriage uh, priority that CDM is using to do this source routed streams. So that's the story. Uh, uh, one last bit of update uh, on the hardware stuff. You know, we had problems with my handmade uh, cables uh, having problems, um, like shorting out. So I started looking in particular for these Y splitters, and I bought some because they were super cheap. And when I got them, it was like, hey, these are super cheap. Uh, um, and they were warming up. The, these were my power supply adapters that I was using. This is a 5 amp uh, adapter. It was getting pretty hot, at least when I was using it with these cheap Y splitters. So I uh, went back and tried to shop for 18 uh, gauge wire. The smaller the gauge, the bigger the wire. 18 is a, it's a hefty gauge. That's pretty good. So two pack of two splitters for nine bucks sounded pretty good. Uh, but the reviews were like, yeah, they said they were 18, but they actually had a 22 gauge inside. And 22 was like the stuff that I was having that was getting hot. So that was not very encouraging. He got some of them and they were good and some of them were bad. Uh, uh, eventually I found this one that uh, looked, you know, pretty clearly it was the right thing. It was nine bucks for one. So I got a couple of them. So they came in. Uh, they are... Uh, uh, they they are heavy they're the real thing you know there it is it's it's 18 gauge you you can just feel it it's nice it's solid so we might be talking nine bucks a pop for the wise you know so be it, it uh as long as we can keep getting them in stock also tried some bigger uh, power supplies here's a six amp power supply i also got this monster 10 amp one uh, uh, <laughs> the six amp uh, power supply weighs 200 grams. It doesn't feel too bad. The 10 amp one weighs uh, almost double, <laughs> almost 400 grams. Uh, uh, I've tried out the 6 amp one so far uh, uh, and with the new uh, cable. It's working great. Uh, powers up the power zone. I left it overnight for hours and hours. It was still cool to the touch. Uh, um, the split, the Y's were fine. Uh, the power supply was at 93 degrees, which, you know, really is fine so i think uh six amp power supplies with the 18 gauge cable that's probably where we want to end up all right so that's it um long time uh viewers of these t2 Day updates will remember that a year ago in november i did nano remo the national novel writing month um I'm thinking of doing that again. I'm thinking of doing that uh, to actually work on the same novel I worked on last time. But in addition, I am going to put myself on the record to make uh, the second lecture in this whole separate thing that's happened on the Dave Ackley channel, the Hyperspace Academy. Uh, uh, an introduction to classical hyperspace. It, it, I did lecture one seven years ago, and I really have been thinking about it a lot, and the whole living computation stuff is really Really centrally related to it and uh, I really think it's time to get out as clear and ringing a living computation manifesto in the form of the second lecture in the Hyperspace Academy Introduction to Classical Hyperspace. So I want to put myself on the line to have that out by December 1st something like that, the end of NaNoWriMo. And what I would like to do, if, if I figure out how to work all this, is to send out a early access to all the Living Computation Foundation nerds. Uh, uh, you know, a couple of days early, just to say thank you, just to, you know, have extra thoughts and, and, and to see what people think. You know, again, the nerd, the proud, LCF. <laughs> and... Uh, um, and uh, so if, if folks uh, want to sign up and, and get a LCFN, that would be super cool. You know, we also have a couple of folks who are monthly donors. It's incredible. It's, it's fantastic. You know, thank you guys. Uh, um, so that's it. Uh, the next T Tuesday update will be uh, October 27th, so two more weeks. And then that'll be it for a month, ex except for the LCFN nerds. LCFN nerds. The LCF nerds. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, uh, it's a crazy world. Uh, um, I've got my uh, uh, mail-in ballot uh, ready to go. Uh, well, not ready to go. Ready to get ready to go. Get it out tomorrow. 
Hope you're safe. Hope you're well. Thanks for coming by. Hope to see you next time. At the Hyperspace Academy, we advocate high-dimensional thinking. Learn why.